Welcome back. In this section, we're going to start talking about some of the hormones being produced by the adenohypophysis and where those hormones have their effect. So the first thing, uh, when we're talking about specific hormones from now on, I'm going to be talking about this is the normal physiological effect. And then I'm going to talk about what happens if you don't have enough of it or you have what we call hyposecretion. So in other words, we have inadequate hormone secretion. Our, our feedback mechanism isn't working correctly. And this could be due to trauma to the organ that's secreting it. It could be not enough releasing hormone coming down not, or whatever. Or it can be due to autoimmune diseases. And then if that's the yang, the yang would be when we have too much of the hormone being secreted or we have hypersecretion. And these are often caused by autoimmune diseases as well, but they also are caused by tumors which produce these hormones, which is really kind of a cool thing. So if you have a chance, take a, a, an advanced um, endocrine class or a pathology class to learn about some of this stuff. So starting first with growth hormone the G of flat pig. And growth hormone also goes by another name, which is somatotropin. Soma meaning the entire body. So the, this is a tropic hormone in that it affects cells which are distributed throughout the body. And when we look at all the hormones being produced by the pituitary, there's more than a thousand times the amount of growth hormone than there is any other hormone. So hundreds of times more growth hormone than all the other hormones put together. And as I said before, its target cells are widespread, but there's four major target cells we're going to mention, and that is the liver. And then from the liver, it has direct effects onto bone, onto muscle, and on adipose tissue. And so the overall effect of growth hormone is growth. Cellular growth, mitosis, increase the number of cells. And the net result is protein synthesis and fat catabolism. So if we look at these four organs directly, what we will notice is growth hormone actually directly decreases the amount of adipose tissue, which otherwise goes up once you start hitting a menopause, male or female menopause. And this is why some of the older body um, conscious people I'm thinking Sylvester Stallone here, start taking massive amounts of growth hormone. In addition to that, they want the other effects, which actually the other effects are all modulated through the liver because it makes the liver secrete something called insulin-like growth factor, which is a growth factor which works on both bone and muscle. So it makes bones grow. So you have um, less risk of osteoporosis and you have heavier bones. And it also, um, because of the protein synthesis, increases the muscle mass. So growth hormone is very much responsible for having a muscular, lean body. So when we look at growth hormone, how are we getting growth hormone? Well, we have growth hormone releasing hormone coming from the hypothalamus having its effect on the adenohypophysis, which is releasing growth hormone, which then has its effect on the target tissues, which were liver, muscle, bone, and adipose tissue. All right, so I didn't include it here, but why don't you go back and see if you can fill out a negative feedback loop for growth hormone, it's pretty straightforward. Um, in addition to growth hormone releasing hormone, there is a hormone, hormone called somatostatin, which is growth hormone inhibiting factor, inhibiting hormone, which blocks growth hormone production. Okay? So this is the only example of an inhibiting hormone I'm going to talk about, but just realize for the other hormones later on, there are inhibiting hormones that we could have talked about, but are choosing not to. So if you have a lack of growth hormone, insufficient growth hormone production from a young age, you do not grow up like a normal adult. You have perfect adult proportions, but you are the size of a two-year-old. So think under, you know, somewhere around two, two and a half feet tall. Nowadays, this can be easily diagnosed in childhood and treated with human growth hormone. Now, this disease is known as pituitary dwarfism. This type of dwarfism is not the same type that you see 
when people are talking about the midgets or the dwarfs that were in the Wizard of Oz. That's achondroplastic dwarfism, which is an inherited disease. And pituitary dwarfism is a growth hormone lack disease. All right. If you have too much growth hormone in your young age, what's going to happen is you're going to have long bone growth because this is going to stimulus, stimulate the epiphyseal plate that make lots of cartilage to undergo mitosis. So you have a bigger epiphyseal plate and then more endochondral ossification. And so your long bones grow longer and longer. And the most common cause for this is going to be a pituitary tumor. So in this picture, you can see that the pituitary gland is quite large. Now, the people who at a young age have excess growth hormone, that they're super tall, and they're the people we call giants. But the name of the disease is not giantism, it's gigantism with that extra G in there. And at first glance, it may seem like, oh, that's not a bad disease to have because you can sit on a chair and change light bulb. And God knows I would really appreciate that at times. But you've got to admit, looking at this bottom right corner picture, that the dating is going to be less than ideal here. Plus, there are other diseases associated with it. Now, that, that is the disease you get if it's before your epiph epiphyseal line occurs. Now, if you get excess growth hormone production from a pituitary tumor, for instance, or for whatever reason, after you are done with your growth, which pretty much all of you are pretty much done at this point. So if five, 10 years from now you had this problem, you would not be having long bone growth. You would not have gigantism. The disease you would have would be called acromegaly. And you still are getting excessive bone growth, but because we don't have epiphyseal plates, we can't get length, so we are going to have width, thickness happening. And this happens throughout your body. And students often think because I have a picture of hands and feet, this is where the only places it's happening. But basically your hands, your hands, your feet, these are the places of your body where the bones are closest to the surface. So this is where you're much more likely to notice it. Like for instance, if you had an extra quarter inch or half inch of bone growth in your face, it would deform your face. You would really notice it. But if you had it in your thigh, you might just think, oh, my pants shrunk. I just need, you know, bigger pants or something like that. So typical places for the bone growth is in the face. Can you see this extra bone being grown here on the frontal bone? And also the chin tends to become very prominent. Um, the hands and feet grow as well. And so on the left side, this is a picture of a normal hand. And if you notice on the right side, the glove doesn't fit that hand, okay? Um, and so you need specialized clothing being made. There are other um, things that happen with this. This is not a great disease to have. All right, I have pictures here of both a man and a lady that have growth hormone. If we start with the man first, over here in this picture on the left, you can see he's kind of like the Brad Pitt of his day. He's a good looking dude. And then if you look at his pictures over the next several years, you get all the way to this right when you go, okay, so when he was 70, he wasn't quite so good looking. But I want you to realize this is not a 30, 40 year progression. This is a progression over about 10 years. And, and the same thing with this picture of the lady, and I actually have the dates for this one from 1977 to 1988. This lady aged about 30 years in her looks due to this disease of acromegaly. So there are lots of complications that go on with both gigantism and acromegaly, including high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease. So it's not a disease that you really want to wish for. With that, we are done with growth hormone and we're going to move on to the thyroid gland and talk about thyroid hormones. So I want to point out when I say thyroid hormones, those are two very specific hormones made by the thyroid gland. But don't forget, we've already talked about calcitonin made from the thyroid gland. So there's actually three hormones. So we say name all the hormones from the thyroid gland. There's three you should be able to name. But if we say name the thyroid hormones, like when we're talking about people are taking thyroid hormone, you do not name calcitonin because that is not what people are having to take 
when they have problems with hypothyroidism. So let's go back to the same pictures we had before of the thyroid gland. Remember the calcitonin came from these C cells, these blue cells on the inside. Now we're going to be talking about these pink cells, which are follicular cells and the pink amorphous material, non-cellular material known as colloid in the middle. So these follicular cells produce a protein known as thyroglobulin. So we've had that word globulin before, it just means a protein. And so this is a protein made by the thyroid gland, so it's called thyroglobulin. And each thyroglobulin contains many molecules of amino acid known as tyrosine. Okay? And so this thyroglobulin with the tyrosine attached gets released into the colloid. Now, taking a little detour for a second, I want to talk about iodide. Iodide in your blood is taken up by these follicular cells where it's converted to the active form iodine. And once it's converted, then it is released into the colloid where the tyrosine is located. And it's like, what a first sight. So the iodine is going to bind to some of those tyrosine molecules, which are, the, which are here. And either one or two iodines can bind. So it could be monoiodinated tyrosine or diiodinated tyrosine. And then the iodated tyrosines are going to link. And when they link, basically a thyroglobulin is going to break away. Because remember, the tyrosines have thyroglobulins attached to each other. And so when you have two of these tyrosines linked together, you're either going to have three of the iodines or four of the iodines attached. And so if there's three that are attached, that's called triiodothyrosine, which is this right here. There's a tyrosine, there's a tyrosine. This one has two iodines. That one has one for a net of three. That is the thyroid hormone, which you can call T3. Now, if tyrosines, each of which had two iodines and they bonded together, then you would have tetraiodothyronine with two up there and two down there, more commonly known as thyroxine, which you can call T4. So these hormones, T3 and T4, are made there in the colloid and they hang out in the colloid waiting for the signal. Is it time yet? Is it time yet for their release? What's the signal when TSH coming from the adenohypophysis finally makes its way to the thyroid gland and the follicular cell, which is the target cell, when it binds to the follicular cell, then what happens? The T3 and T4 in a little vesicle under, um, it gets released from the thyroid gland. So 90% of what is secreted from the thyroid gland is going to be thyroxine or T4. And what is very interesting is thyroxine has very little biological effect. And what happens is it travels to its target tissues where it's then converted to T3. And it binds then to a receptor in the nucleus. So you're going, wait a second. Earlier, on the bottom left, you were telling us these are amino acids, tyrosine, which made this a protein-based hormone, and it is. But now you're saying its receptor is in the nucleus, but that doesn't happen that, except in lipid-based hormones. And that's the big conundrum because, well, it's not really a conundrum, but that is what's like so amazing and that the thyroid hormones decided they were gonna break all the rules. Yes, they are peptide-based hormones, but yes, they act like steroid-based hormones. So they're playing both sides of the field. What can I say? So what are the effects of thyroid hormones? Well, it's critical to have normal thyroid levels in a pregnant mother for that baby or else that baby's brain as well as other organs do not develop normally. Getting away from pregnancy, thyroid hormone if you will, has an effect on heart rates and how much inotropic effect there is in the heart. It helps promote blood flow to organs, and it has a lot to do with activating sodium potassium pumps, um, and so it increases your basal metabolic rate. So you can pause it and you can read all the various little details here. So. Just to refresh your memory, we're gonna have 
a hormone from the hypothalamus. It's TRH, but it is not thyroid releasing hormone. It's thyrotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, which then travels through the hypophyseal portal system to get to the adenohypophysis, which releases the T of flat pig, which is thyroid stimulating hormone which then travels in blood, goes to the follicular cells and the thyroid gland where T3 and T4 are going to be released, which then goes to its target organs for the metabolic effects. So time to practice your negative feedback loop. And you have a picture here that will help you. It has all the words you need so you don't have to flip back. And I want to point out because we have that president, manager, worker, we have two areas of negative feedback. So you have to give negative feedback to the president as well as the manager. So the hormones you're talking about here are your thyroid hormones, okay? So, and the negative feedbacks are both to the president and to the manager. Doesn't matter if you talk about the manager first or the president first, just make sure you have both of those down there. And if you have any questions, be sure to come ask me. So let's talk about the yin and the yang, too much and not enough. So hopefully looking at this, you do recognize that this is the United States outlined in blue. But in the upper half of the United States, you can see this area that is pink and almost all of it has the slash marks. What this is, is identifying the areas um, and the peachy area where there is iodine deficiency. Okay. And then in the slash marks, that is where the incidence of a complication I'm going to show you related to hypothyroidism occurs. I do want to point out the part of the reason why this area doesn't match is has to do um, with getting data from Native Americans at the time this graphing was made. So when you have iodine deficiency, what happens is your body is still getting the message, hey, we need some more T3, T4 out here. And so your body kicks out what it has, and then you're still getting the message, we don't have any T3, T4 because you don't have any, because you don't have any iodine to bind to the tyrosine to make the T3, T4. So the follicular cells are going, oh my goodness, it must be our problem. We need to make some more thyroglobulin. So your follicular cells will undergo hypertrophy, hyperplasia. And so your thyroid gland enlarges because it's kicking out more and more thyroglobulin in hopes of having whatever iodine might be floating around in your body to attach to it. And so that leads to something which is an enlarged thyroid gland, um, which is known as a goiter, the last word on this list of six terms. And of course, I'm going to show you a picture with a pretty prominent goiter um, because I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you like a super obvious example of it. And so if you don't have enough iodine or you don't have which means you don't have enough T3 or T4, or if you don't have enough T3 and T4 for any other reason, that means your metabolism is going to plummet. So you're gonna quit burning calories, you're gonna gain weight, your hair becomes very thick, your pulse drops, you have dry skin, and basically you're just kind of like miserable. And it's a very gradual thing, and so oftentimes people don't really notice it. So what was the cure for that? Iodized salt after World War II. So now when you're using salt, unless you're using kosher salt or you're specific, you're looking for non-iodized salt or you're only using sea salt, everybody has adequate iodized salt. And if you're only using sea salt, well, if you're getting any canned food, frozen food, eating out at restaurants, you're getting plenty of iodized salt because there's way too much salt in American food. All right, so we already talked about growth hormone and I showed you some pretty drastic pictures of people with um, diseases due um, to growth hormone. And here I have pictures of a girl and this is what she looked like when she was at school. And you can kind of tell she might have been mocked. And then she got diagnosed with hypothyroidism and then you can see she's actually quite pretty, quite cute once she was treated. So this is the time of the course that I want to remind all of you that you're taking this course because supposedly you want to go into some kind of healthcare field. 
So it's time for you to start acting more mature and like an adult and quit mocking and going, oh, when you see people who don't look what you think is that beautiful picture that here in the United States, we've come to associate with how people should look. And the reason for this is you have absolutely no idea what disease that person might have, which makes them have the side effects, which gives them the way that they look and they cannot control it. So it's time to start being kind and being a lot more mature than you may have been at a younger age. All right, so in contrast to hypothyroidism, the opposite would be hyperthyroidism, where now your metabolic rate is sky high, so your pulses are up, you lose weight without even trying, you have trouble sleeping, you're hot all the time. You still can have a goiter because the, maybe you're hypothyroid because your thyroid is overactive. So the having a goiter doesn't tell you if you're hypothyroid or you're hyperthyroid or if you got thyroid cancer. It just means we need to be doing some investigation into your thyroid. And the last and very significant side effect that's associated with hyper her thyroidism is something, the bottom thing on the list, which is known as ex ophthalmos. So normally when you are looking at people, you don't see the whites in a whole 360 around their eyes unless they're raising their eyebrows for a fact or they're scared of something. So if you're walking through Walmart and you see ladies or gentlemen whose eyeballs look like they're bulging, you see the whites all the way around, every healthcare professional is going to walk by and go, hyperthyroid. Thyroid. Because on the long list of 100 things that may cause this exophthalmos hyperthyroidism is probably 90% of them. Okay. And so I don't want to get into the physiology of how this happens, but basically what happens is yes, the reason why you're seeing the whites all around is because the eyeballs are bulging anteriorly. And this is a bad problem because it means that the eyelids can't completely cover the eyeballs necessarily. And these people have to tape their eyes shut at night when they sleep or else they'll wake up and their corneas will be dried and they become blind with corneal ulcers. And so I just put a scan here so that you can clearly see like, here's the cheekbones, here's the eyeball, there's the nose. And like, do you understand how far forward that has to be? for your eyes to be at the level of your nasal bones. Yeah, okay, so when I say they're bulgy, I mean they're really bulgy. Okay, of course they're not, you're not gonna wake up with them really bulgy overnight, but if you ever see this in somebody develop over time, definitely say you need to go see your primary care practitioner. And with that, we are done with growth hormone and the thyroid hormone, and I'll um, make sure you do the feedback loops. Ask if you have any questions. Thank you for all your hard work on the endocrine system. Once you kind of get it, it all falls into place. But I will see you as we continue with hormones coming from the adrenal cortex, which is next. Thank you.